We come to church, we come every Sunday to hear the message. Uh, but not only to hear the message, we also come to practice the message. And I hope you realize that uh, from time to time, the events of this life remind us that there is a gap between what we hear and what we practice. Uh, this is what happened in our church uh, this week on Wednesday. Two of our sisters in the church, they usually gather here every Wednesday to uh, pray for the church for all of us. I used to call them and I still call them our prayer warriors. Uh, these two sisters, and I will not mention their name by respect for them because it's a bit embarrassing your story. Uh, as they came and prayed, they were praying, they prayed at least one hour every Wednesday. And they were praying with power for the will of God to be done in our church. And as they were praying, they heard a noise, a very strange noise, I think from this AC or the other one, maybe this one. They heard a strange noise, but they were so focused on Jesus Christ that they didn't, didn't bother them. They continued to pray, and at the end of the prayer, as they stopped praying and stopped focusing on Jesus, and as they were about to leave the church, they came to switch off the AC, and they found themselves face to face with a snake. Now, these two sisters, uh, we have the evidence that they are really united in spirit, because uh, in unity, they shouted together, and they ran away from the church, and they turned their back to the cross, and we realize here at that moment that there is a gap between what we profess, our profession of faith, and our practice of faith. Indeed, these two sisters are the ones who initiated a special camp, and the title or the topic of this camp was Be Courageous, Be Strong and Courageous. This is what they told to our kids. And when they faced this snake last Wednesday, it seems like there is some gap that they have to cover. So, I hope we uh, are going to be uh, to realize that uh, hearing the sermon every Sunday is very important. Uh, we also need to practice it, and hopefully this is what we will do after this uh, sermon. But we thank God, of course, these two sisters, uh, they return back to church, and they are still in our midst, and they are still alive, and we bless God for that. Now let's move to our sermon. Uh, I would not mention the names, of course. Uh, you may find out if you have the gift, the spiritual gift of discernment. You may find out. Okay, uh, let's go to the sermon of today. <laughs> uh, the sermon of today is uh, the second of our series on uh, the joy of Christmas. Uh, so last time we talked about uh, the joy of parenting uh, as we studied the passage in Luke 1 about the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist and we saw the joy of parenting that uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah could feel because they didn't have kids and they were old and God blessed them with a kid. But now today we are going to see the joy of the messenger because we will focus on the shepherds. Now if anyone would like to volunteer to read in Luke chapter 2 verse 8 to 20, that would be good. That would be a good help for me. Luke chapter 2 verse 8 to 20. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you very much my brother. Thank you Stephen. shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But 
But Mary treasured up all these things and considered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, what a change to have uh, a British accent. Oh, I love it. Thank you very much. I hope you will hear more of uh, you or your family uh, doing the readings. I uh, enjoy it. Now, the, this text is very is well known by many of us. Uh, we hear this text uh, every almost every Christmas. But sometimes we don't pay attention to some details in uh, the text which we are very familiar with. Now, maybe to introduce my point, I would like to mention about uh, what happened on the 2nd of May, 1945. On the 2nd of May, 1945, one of the bloodiest, bloodiest battles in the history, in our history, the Battle of Berlin came to an end. The Soviet army finally overcame the German Nazis. The Battle of uh, Berlin was one of the final major offensive during the World War II, and it brought, it, it brought the dark group of Hitler to an end. Yevgeny Kaldei was among the first witnesses of that historical moment, that historical victory which marked the transition, the beginning of a new era. He was so joyful that he took a picture of a Soviet soldier here, as you can see, who climbed on the top of the Reichstag building in order to raise a flag on the top of the Reichstag, the Soviet army flag, as to tell people the war is over. We overcame the Nazis. Yevgeny Kaldei took the photograph. He returned immediately to Moscow he edited the pictures and he sent it around. And this picture, which is very well, very famous, which is named actually Raising a Flag over the Reichstag, has become one of the most significant and recognizable image of World War II. Yevgeny Kaldei was a messenger of a message of joy to the world through this photograph. In our text of today, the shepherds were the first witnesses of the coming of our Lord Jesus on earth. They witnessed a unique event in history. They were joyful, and in their joy, they went around and announced the good news to people. They were definitely messengers of joy. Now, as we study this text, one thing that really puzzled me was why amongst all the people that, that exist on earth, why God picked the shepherds to be the first witnesses of this event? After all, we are talking about the coming of the most important person on earth, Jesus Christ. So, as such, that news should be given first to very important persons, maybe to Caesar, maybe to Herod, maybe to kings, to governors, or maybe to the synagogue leaders, or maybe to the family of Joseph and Mary first. Why the shepherds? Oh, that's a puzzling question. And as I look a bit closer to the life of the shepherds, what I see in the Bible is that there is a pattern, a very consistent pattern of God showing kind of favor to the shepherds. In the first family on earth, Abel was a shepherd. Abraham, the father of the faithful, was a shepherd. He became the father of the faithful. Jacob was a shepherd. He became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. David, the man after God's own heart, was a shepherd. This seems clearly to be a pattern of God favoring the shepherds. Again, why the shepherds? Now, as I study a bit about the, the shepherds, I think I can safely make the proposition that the joy of the messenger 
that God preferred to give the message to those who are the humblest. The shepherd indeed were people of a very humble social category. In our text of today, if you remember in uh, one of the, I think if, if I'm not mistaken, in, uh, in verse 8, he said they were living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. Uh, these are night workers. They work at night in a very difficult condition, be it winter or summer. They had to stay awake, so they had many sleepless nights because uh, usually uh, lions or some predatory animals would come to attack the flock. So they have to protect the flock. So it was a dangerous job. It was not well paid. They were not educated people. They were people who live with all their families because they have to spend the night outside with the flock, with the sheep. So most of the time they would not see their wives and children. They would travel far away because they have to take the sheep to greener pastures and then come back weeks, months later, there were definitely people who, I think we can safely say, they didn't really enjoy their lives. As such, when they received the news that there is going to be a change, a radical change, that their life will not be the same anymore, that there will be a new joy, a new kind of life, I think these people value more the message of the good news of the coming of Jesus. Many years ago, when I was a church goer rather than a follower of Christ, I used to secretly hope in my heart to find some verses in the Bible that can justify some of my sinful lives. For instance, I wish I could find a verse that can say, you know, if someone hurts you, you can forgive once, twice, but if the person keeps hurting you, there must be a verse that says, okay, now you don't forgive a person anymore. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't find that. Luke 17, 3 says that if your brother sins against you, and you must rebuke the brother. But if the brother repents, you must forgive it. Even if it is seven times a day, you must forgive that brother. Hmm. Another verse I wish I could find in the Bible was, maybe it would be good to find you know, a verse that says, you know, the sin of maybe... Pornography is not adultery because after all you don't touch the person. No. Matthew 5 verse 28 says, I tell you that if anyone looks a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. I wish I could find a verse in the Bible that says, you know, after you give maybe 10% of your offering, of your, your revenues, the rest of the money belongs to you. You can buy whatever you want, a house, cows. No. Agai 2 verse 8 says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. Indeed, when we became Christian, we realized that God is not expecting, is not planning to do a kind of a slight cosmetic change in our life. He's planning to do a radical change, a new life, a new era. And so many of us, many people, they don't welcome the good news of Christmas because it means a radical change of life. The shepherds, they welcome it because for them, their lives, they did not enjoy it really. They were hoping to see a change. They were hoping to see that the oppression of the Roman army would be radically changed to the protection of the angel's army. When they say uh, heavenly host, that means the army of angels. They were hoping to see a change, like the angels took over the Roman's army. They were hoping to see the, 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 the sleepless night to be replaced with the sweetness of the holy night. They were hoping to see the hostility between the lions and the sheep of the flock to be replaced with the harmony that used to be in the Garden of Eden or in the Ark of Noah amongst animals. They were hoping for a drastic change. As such, they received the good news of Christmas and they were joyful. So the point, my brothers and sisters, is that we can enjoy that joy we can receive that joy. God will send that joy in our heart only when we are the humblest. Only when we despise our life. Only when we are seeking, hoping for a change. Unfortunately, it is to be feared that many Christians are not really in a hurry to go to heaven. Many Christians, if God comes today and says, this is the end of the world, 
it's time to go to heaven. I think some of us may regret, I hope not in this church, may regret that this event comes too soon. But actually, it should be the opposite. We should long for the new order, the new life, and as such, God can put that joy in our heart. The second point I want to share with you about the joy of those shepherds, those messengers, is that this joy actually depends on our faith. I experienced one of the greatest joys of my life on the 4th of December, 2004. Yeah, maybe you cannot recognize me. I had some hair at that time. Uh, this was the day Marina accepted to be my fiancé. She accepted to be my fiancé and we were engaged on that day, December 2004. This was one of the days when I felt a very special joy in my heart. Marina and I, we were not married. We were only engaged. I could not yet enjoy Marina, enjoy living with her, enjoy being in the same house as her. That will happen only two years later. But I was already joyful. I had a certainty that my life is going to be greater. It's going to be better with this woman in my life. I had that certainty. Though she was not yet my wife. But you see, brothers and sisters, we need something in order to have that joy. And I call it faith. The messenger, the, the shepherds, when we read in our text of today, in verse 12, what we read is, in verse 12, we read that this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. The angels are telling them this is going to be a new world. A new order. And we give you one sign. That sign is you will find the baby. That baby is the savior, is the king. Go and find that baby. They find the baby and they put their faith in that baby and they say, yes, what the angel said is going to be true. But Jesus was just a baby at that point. He could not save them. He could not do anything against the Roman Empire. He could not do anything at that age. They knew that this baby has to grow, has to grow up, and maybe one day, then he would become the king. So their joy was based on faith. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 verse 1, you all know this verse, I guess, now faith is the confidence of what we hope and the assurance of what we do not see. I had hope, assurance that my life would be better simply because Marina put the ring on her finger. They had the assurance that there would be salvation simply because they saw the baby. But the salvation has not yet come, actually. And we know that the church, as it is today, is not yet married with Christ. The church is engaged, is a fiancé of Christ. We read, for instance, uh, in Revelation 21, verse 1 and 2, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, listen, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The church will be married. There will be the waiting with Christ at the end. But for now, the church has only been reserved. The church is only engaged. And that's why we read, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What does it mean, sealed for the day of redemption? You see, brother and sister, in those days, sealing, sealing, they used to seal the documents with some wax. And basically, the sealing basically was to make that the document would remain undamaged, and it was a means of authentication. It was a means of identification and authentication. No one can touch that document. It is sealed till the owner come and open it. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit till Jesus comes and takes us. So we have a hope. And our joy is not based on whether our life is better in terms of uh, finance, our life is better in terms of uh, health, or whatever. Our hope and our joy is only based on the fact 
that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit is in us. And we see the work of the Holy Spirit in us. That's what makes our joy. It doesn't, our joy doesn't depend on the circumstance around us, whether the speaker works or not, whether my wife or the husband is faithful or not, whether there is a, a job and employment. No. Our joy is based only on the fact, the truth, that the Holy Spirit, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. He lives in us, and that's what makes our joy. So the sign for the shepherd was, so let me go back to that. The joy of the messenger, the joy of the shepherds, was based simply on their faith. You will be more joyful in Christ, depending on your faith, my brothers and sisters. You put your faith on the promise of God, on the Holy Spirit working in you, your joy will be greater. You put your faith on what you see around us. You want to see changes. You want to see better promotion at work or so on. No, that joy will fluctuate with the circumstances. That's not the joy of the Lord. Finally, the last point I would like to share with you, and maybe before I move to that last point, that joy that we see, that we have in us, when Christmas comes and we celebrate, we remember the coming of our Lord Jesus on earth, we have the certainty that this world will not remain the same, that one day it will change. We have the certainty that pedophilia will cease, racism will cease, homosexuality will cease. We will have the certainty that unemployment, divorce, depression, anxiety, loneliness, hatred, adultery, all those things, we have the certainty. They will cease. Therefore, we go in tomorrow, we face tomorrow with confidence, with faith. And that's why Christian, in my opinion, our message to the world is more powerful in the midst of suffering, actually. It's more powerful when things around us, when there is COVID-19, when people cannot travel, when people complain, oh, come on, we don't travel, we are stuck here in Thailand, we cannot see our family. Our message is stronger when we are able to exhibit the peace, the joy, in the midst of suffering. Because we have a hope, the hope that there is a certainty this baby will become the savior a couple of years later. We have the certainty, I have the certainty that Marina will become a lovely a wonderful wife now i can confirm it and we have the certainty that the holy spirit in us will complete the work that he has started and finally brothers and sisters what i would like to share with you is that the joy of the shepherds or the joy of the messengers is a joy that always yields praise to god now this sounds obvious to you because we all come to church and we praise God. Now I would like to tell you something different about praise and worship this morning. Praise is defined as a warm expression of admiration. That's the definition of praise. So we can ask ourselves, what were the shepherds admiring in that night? It cannot be the decoration of the manger. Like we love to, you know, we are amazed by the Christmas tree and the lights on the Christmas tree. I don't think there was any light because there was no electricity in those days. I don't think they were admiring the Christmas cakes. How oh, we enjoy the Christmas cakes and food at Christmas. I don't think uh, Joseph and Mary had time to go and bake cakes for them. I don't think they were enjoying gifts uh, from uh, Santa Claus. Uh, at that night, I think they were only Mary. Joseph and a few animals around them, no Santa Claus. So what were they admiring at that night? What was the subject, the reason for their praise? Now verse 20, if you go back to our text, when you read verse 20, actually we realize through the text that uh, at least five things happened to those shepherds. Type five things that we can consider as the reason of their praise, as the reason why they admire, because praise is an expression of admir admiration. Now, the first thing we can say is that they saw multiple angels. This doesn't happen to many people. They saw angels. That is wow. 
The second thing we can say is that uh, they had, the Bible says, there was the glory, if you read here, verse 9, and the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. So there was a glory of God shining around them. Oh, that's what the second thing. The third thing we can say is that they hear the angels singing this very famous song that we love. At the end, verse 14, glory to God in the highest heaven, which is well known as uh, Gloria in Alexis's Deo. The fourth thing we can say is that they heard the Lord, that the Lord would bring great joy to people on earth, to those his favor rests on, and they saw the Lord Jesus. Now, some of us may say, ah, oh, you know, we never saw angels, we never saw Jesus, we have never been to that situation, so we don't have reason to rejoice like them. Now, I would like to challenge you, brothers and sisters. I think we see more than them. I think we experience more than them. Therefore, I think we have more reasons to be more joyful. Now, the angels, they saw multiple angels. Now, the word angel, it comes from Greek word angelo, which means messengers. The angels didn't have wings, like we see in some pictures. They didn't have wings. That's something that comes from the imagination of people. Angels, actually, when they appear to men, they appear in the form of human beings. In the Bible, maybe you remember the text of Isaiah chapter 6, where it mentioned about seraphim. The seraphim, they had wings. The seraphim are not angels. The people in the time of Jesus, they were used to see angels. Our problem is we live in a time of science, technology, and uh, we are very rational. And uh, when someone mentioned about a vision, we say, ah, oh, that's probably a hallucination. hallucination. Look what happened in Acts chapter 12, verse 14. You may remember the story of Peter going to jail in prison, and then he was freed by an angel. And when he came back to the church, because the church was praying for him, he came back, see what the church said. Verse 14, when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed. That was a girl. Peter knocked at the door. And she opened, she said, oh, Peter, she heard the voice of Peter. She didn't open the door. She went to tell others. She said, so the Bible said, when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Peter is at the door. And then they replied, the rest of the church replied to her, you are out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. They were serious about angels. They said, they believed that people, angels, were amongst people from time to time. What if I tell you that uh, angel or the Lord appeared to me once and uh, spoke to me? You say, oh, my son, my son. Some hallucination. We don't believe in that. I believe that angels still speak to people. They appear and say, oh, maybe it's just a dream. Or maybe, you know, uh, I don't know what happened. Let me forget. But the Lord actually appeared to me. I don't know if it was the Lord or it was an angel appeared to me once, many years ago, and spoke to me. It was very clear. And I keep that word very seriously, and that's why I'm a pastor today, because that was already told, announced to me. Angels have not ceased to operate. They visit people still, but we are very rational and scientific now. We say, it cannot be. They saw the glory of God shining around them. The glory of God, the, the, the word glory, glory simply means the holiness, the manifold of the beauty of God made manifest. That's what it means to glorify God, the glory. Now, are you sure you have never seen the manifestation of the holiness of God around you? In this church, how would you qualify the testimonies of brothers like Mustafa, Moa, who are refugees, they have, not more, they have not enough money, they don't know about the future, they don't know about the tomorrow, and they shine joy, they are joyful more than many of us here. Don't you think that is the glory of God shining around you? What do you think of sisters who are going through difficult time in their marriage and they are still shining with joy? Don't you think this is the glory of God around you? What do I think myself when I have a cancer and my joy is even greater? with the cancer than before the cancer. Don't you think this is the glory of God shining around you? Brothers and sisters, 
the glory of God has not ceased. It happens around us. Now, the third thing I mentioned is that the angel, sorry, the shepherd, they heard the angel singing, Glory to God and Gloria in excessive deo. We will sing that song on Christmas, I'm sure. Beautiful song. It was amazing. I can imagine to listen to angels singing in the night. It must be special. But have you never experienced a time of worship, praising, where you have the impression that the room is filled with angels around you? You have the impression that those voices are not human voices. This person cannot sing with a human voice like that. It must be an angel somewhere. Have you never experienced those moments where you basically cry, cry of joy, you have tears of joy as you are worshiping with some people? We do, brothers and sisters. The fourth thing that happened to those shepherds is that they heard that the Lord will bring great joy to those on whom his favor rests. When you became Christian, tell me, what was the first, one of the key first characteristics of your conversion? I hope you will tell me it is a great joy. For me, it was a great job. I had no money. I was uh, jobless. I was a student. I was not French. I was in France. I was almost a refugee. I had a very difficult life at that point. I couldn't even not find sense to buy food. I even stole rice from a neighbor to have food on that day on some, at, at some point. But when I became Christian, even without anything, I was so joyful. Joy was one of the first evidence of our conversion. Yes, a great joy can, will come. That's why the angel announced to them and they felt that joy. And I feel that joy when I became Christian. Number five, they witnessed the birth of the Lord Jesus. Now you say, oh, no, no, nobody has seen Jesus. We were not there. They were luckier than us. They could see Jesus. We haven't seen Jesus. We wait for when Jesus will come back, then we will see Jesus. If this is what you think, brothers and sisters, then I wish after this sermon you would change your understanding of seeing, of witnessing the birth of Jesus. You see, the birth of Jesus that you witnessed was something amazing. And I think if you ask me what is the most amazing miracles on earth that has happened that people have seen, as far as I'm concerned, I think the most impressive miracle is the miracle of the new birth. Now let me tell you a bit about the miracle of the new birth. And you will see that what the shepherd witnessed from outside, the birth of Jesus, fell, actually I would say, yeah, it pales in comparison with the new birth, our new birth, as Jesus comes in our life. Now, let me tell you a bit about the new birth. And we will close on this. C.S. Lewis put it this way. When God became man at Christmas, in order to simply, he didn't become man at Christmas in order to simply to produce a better man, which is different from the old kind. No, he came to produce a new kind of man. It is not like teaching a horse to jump better and better, but like turning the horse into a winged creature. Of course, once it has, once the creature has got its wings, it will soar over fences which could never have been jumped. Oh, sorry, which it could never be, uh, it could never do before. The horse doesn't have to jump over the fence. The horse now has wings to soar and fly over the fence. This is how it pictures the new birth. Last Friday, our brother Aaron, he celebrated his third years of sobriety anniversary. For three years, he didn't touch alcohol. He used to be addicted to alcohol. Go and ask Aaron, do you think that event, those three years were something just simple that happened to you or something amazing. It will tell you it's amazing, could not believe it. Now I would like to borrow a parable from uh, George Magdowell to end with this point. George Magdowell wrote this. He said, imagine yourself as a living house. 
God comes in it to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed to be done as you are not surprised. And you are not surprised. But presently, God starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominate, abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is God doing here? The explanation of this is that God is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage. But he is building a palace. And he plans to come. He intends to come and live in that palace himself. That's the new birth, brothers and sisters. When the Bible says in Matthew 5, verse 48, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You know what? God does mean it. He really means, he means, he is transforming us, building us into a perfect creature. He does mean it. So we think that verse is just idealistic. It's impossible. No. God is going to make us into a creature that can obey that comment. He will make the feeblest and the filthiest of us into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pursuing at all true with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright, stainless mirror with which effect, which, sorry, which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale. Brothers and sisters, what I want to share with you this morning is that the shepherd admired the birth of the Lord Jesus. We also ought to admire our own new birth as Christ came into our life. And that's the meaning of Christmas. Jesus came on earth, he came in our life. And this is enough for us to be in admiration. And as we come into admiration, we would praise God. If you are short of ideas what to praise God about, think about your conversion. It's a miracle. It is the greatest miracle you have ever witnessed. The shepherds, they witness those five things. We also witness them in our life. In closing, brothers and sisters, Yevgeny Kaldei he took this picture, he sent it around the world. The word receive and the word believe and say, wow, truly, it is over? The bloodiest time of humanity is over? Hitler is over? Hitler committed suicide two days before, on the 30th of April, 45. And then he said this picture, he took this picture on the 2nd of May. It is over? They planted the flag of the victory on the top of the Reichstag building. And brothers and sisters, I hope really, each of us, in that Christmas season, we will go, announce the good news, planting the flag of Jesus Christ in the fortress of the rebellious souls of men. May this Christmas, brothers and sisters, may we become messengers of joy, of the true joy, the joy that depends only on the coming of Christ. On the promise that everything will be made new. That is our hope. And that is our message to the world, to the people around us. Definitely a new rule has started and it will be made manifest soon or later. May the Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. I will ask my list to help us to meditate on those words and then uh, Moab will come and close in, uh, in prayer.